Off the southeast coast of Alaska is a rugged island where some of the most efficient predators on Earth struggle to survive. In bear country, every day is an adventure. It doesn't matter if you're a mother raising cubs, a biologist doing hands-on work, or an islander just trying to make a living. Here, man and bear compete for the same resources and often come face to face. On Kodiak Island, we're going to follow Katie, the protective mother. Radio collared Rachel. Gloria, the tyrant. And soft hearted Shelly. These magnificent animals will take us on a walk in the footsteps of a bear. Kodiak is a magical place. It's a two million acre island wilderness in the middle of one of the world's most productive marine ecosystems. Fertile streams flow down from the heart of the island, and the salmon feed all kinds of wildlife. The Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge covering two-thirds of the island, has been set aside to protect the natural feeding and breeding range of the largest land predator on Earth, the Kodiak brown bear. About 2,700 of them live here, more wild brown bears per square mile than any place else in the world. Like grizzlies, Kodiak bears are a subspecies of brown bear. They live only on Kodiak, and the abundant salmon here give the bears one of their chief distinguishing characteristics, their phenomenal size. Male Kodiak bears typically weigh up to 1,600 pounds about the same as polar bears and double the size of grizzlies. Like grizzlies, they have a reputation as aggressive adversaries, especially when protecting their young. We tend to exaggerate this fierce image and our misconceptions can profoundly affect the lives of the bears. But Kodiak bears mostly shy away from humans. Most of the 15,000 human residents live in the city of Kodiak, on the island's northeast corner. But there are also people living in six inland villages where there are no roads and the countryside belongs to the bears. Here, people must walk where bears do, on their paths. 
And here, adventurous travelers fly in for one of the most amazing wildlife experiences on Earth. It's a 50-minute journey by seaplane to come face to face with bears at Carlock Lake. To minimize the impact of humans in critical bear habitat, only eight tourists are allowed in per day, and they must follow a careful routine. A guide leads them along a short path to a platform overlooking the Thumb River, which flows into Carlock Lake. The bear viewing platform is on private land within the wildlife refuge. A few left. Just below is one of the bear's favorite salmon spawning grounds. <laughs> Tourists come from all over the world to get this close to bears. And depending on the program, they may pay anywhere from $600 to $1,200 per day for the privilege. In Germany, who doesn't have bears, <laughs> you must come to Alaska. <laughs> I tell you, it's nice, it's, it's great. <laughs> I love this nature. <laughs> On Thumb River, they can watch the bears in their natural habitat without any protective fencing. It can be unnerving, but also exhilarating. I don't even know how to describe this. I mean, it's amazing. It really is amazing. I thought we would come here and we would be fenced back. I mean, I thought that we'd be completely separated, but I would never have dreamt that they'd be just sitting here in front of us. Oh, I think obviously they can be fierce, but basically they want to be left alone. Well, I'm not afraid when I'm with the group. You'd have to be very careful if we weren't. I would picture myself coming across a bear screaming and running the other direction. And I don't know, they're so, I'm, so, I'm calm, you know, it's wonderful. These bears are calm too. Scientists describe them as habituated, meaning that they've learned to tolerate the presence of humans. What you'd be amazed at is how quick they can appear and how silent they are. <laughs> it's just like, pop out, and she's there, suddenly. Mm -hmm. Or they come around behind you, that's why you always need to be looking Naturalist Scott Shelton has been a bear viewing bear. guide on Kodiak Island since 1989. It works really well to pick a location and use the same rules every day and go back to that location and let them get real familiar with your behavior, and then after a while they adjust to your behavior, and then you get scenes like this, where the animal is very relaxed. That's one indicator that there are not any male bears around, is when you see a mom relax like that with her cubs. They can smell each other pretty well from quite a distance. If there was a big male down here right now, she wouldn't be in the river. She would take off in fear of losing her cubs. It's much more danger for it with the males around. Biologists keep track of each bear in the area by number, but they also know them by name and personality. Shelly is everybody's sweetheart. She's been a regular on the Thumb River for years. She's mild-mannered, with a reputation as an attentive mother, 
and the other bears treat her with respect. Shelly's really a, um, a real treat out here to observe. From nursing cubs to observing her cubs play and try to catch fish, it's, there's quite a variety of behavior that one can observe. Every day's a little different out here. High on the hill, overlooking the Thumb River platform, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists Vic Barnes and Greg Wilker are studying how the bear viewing program affects the bears. The marching orders for Greg, as far as this, this study here on the thumb, is that we want to know as much as we can about the bears associated with the bear viewing uh, program. We want to know how many bears uh, go down and are, become habituated. We don't want to know how many bears are not habituated. Do they use the area more in the morning, more in the evening? Uh, are they affected by the behavior of the people? This is the second year of work on the, the thumb study. And last year, we were able to determine how many bears were habituated. And we found very little disturbance uh, related to the people. From this distance, Wilker can keep track of the bears that use the immediate platform area, and also the bears that avoid it completely. For the most part, the people who come here to see the resource don't really understand their impacts. They go to an area like this and they see a bear down in front of them, and in their mind there is no impact there. But there is impact involved in that. There is maybe a bear that wanted to fish there but cannot because those people are there. And we need to weigh all these things when making management decisions on what's going to happen with the rivers. One key decision is how many tourists to let in. There's no shortage of people willing to pay to get close to bears. With about a dozen companies in the business, bear viewing on Kodiak Island has tripled in the past three years. You can have too much bear viewing and you can have too many people occupying these areas where the, the bears want to be and of course this is going to displace some bears and cause problems. It's possible to minimize the impact on bears, but why take the risk in the first place? I think bear view programs are very important, and I, I think education is the strongest thing we have going for us in bear management. And the more people that see bears and learn about bears and behavior, the better off we are in the long term. Managing all the competing interests in a place like Kodiak can be complex. The refuge isn't just a destination for bear viewers. It's also popular with hunters. They're allowed to kill 6% of the bears each year. Refuge managers say this doesn't harm the overall population, but with man and bear walking the same paths, there's bound to be controversy. The Thumb River Bear Viewing Site is part of the only no hunting zone in the refuge, which can have unexpected consequences for the bears. We don't allow hunting in this location, but the rest of the surrounding area is, is a hunting area. And a um, bear from this program or a bear from this area that's, that's grown accustomed to us can walk outside those boundaries and then someone can shoot the bear with thinking that maybe they're shooting a totally wild animal, not a bear that would walk right past them. Both ecotourism and hunting are vital to the Kodiak Island economy, and both depend on a healthy population of bears. So balancing the different needs of humans and bears is a delicate business. I don't find them very ferocious. I think the Kodiaks especially are very forgiving and 
tolerate much that man puts on them. But they can be unforgiving with each other. It starts with the simple pleasures of a good fishing spot. Another bear decides to move in. A loud display of seniority discourages the intruder. On the river, size is power. But the lives of the bears are mostly peaceful, even playful. One indicator when a mother's nursing her cubs is when you hear a sound, like a, a beehive, or it's a constant hum sound. It's um, quite unusual. Shelley's cubs hum like blissful babies. Nursing for two or three years is far more than just a creature comfort. Between birth and maturity, these cubs must increase their body weight by about a thousand fold. That's why bear milk contains 33% fat versus just under 4% fat in human milk. I do have a little bit of a soft spot for females with cubs, as everybody does, uh, especially cubs of the year, the newborn cubs. And because uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty tough struggle here to survive, even with a good food source, you know, we lose a lot of bears. On average, a third of all cubs die before their first birthday. Some get separated from their mothers and starve. Others get killed by roving males. Even experienced mothers like Shelley lose cubs. She started last year with three cubs of the year and one of them was a, a, a little bit of a runt and he didn't survive. But the other two are doing fine and uh, they're learning to fish and uh, they're providing a pretty good show for the bear breeding program, so she's definitely an asset to everybody. For the bears, the year and the struggle to survive begin long before the tourists show up, when the melting snow spills down from the hillsides in March. It's still cold in the uplands as the bears emerge from hibernation. The adult males wake up first. Then come the females with juveniles. Mothers with newborn cubs may linger in the safety of their beds till a month later. Katie is also a regular at Thumb River. She has four new cubs. At birth, they were blind, hairless, and only a little bigger than a gray squirrel. But they've been nursing for several months while their mother slept.
the little bears have come a long way, except the runt. Like big brothers and sisters of any species, they bully him. Play fighting teaches them the skills they'll need when they go out into the world. The cubs play on the slopes, but Katie is still groggy. She hasn't eaten anything for six months, and nursing four cubs has helped burn away 30% of her body weight. She breaks her long fast with a light meal of roots and herbs to help clear the digestive system. There isn't much else to eat up here, but Katie keeps her cubs in the high country to protect them from adult male bears. Here, they'll have time to grow strong while the males travel downhill in search of food. Male bears may kill cubs to bring the mother into heat. A female is only ready to breed when she's not nursing. This time of year is never easy for young bears, but the hardest time in every cub's life comes in the spring of its second or third year, when mama finally says, enough. The devoted mother literally runs off her old litter. He's not her baby anymore, and it's time for him to make his own way in the world. He's what biologists call a sub-adult, a sulky teenager. He isn't sure why he's been abandoned. Mama's given him all the necessary survival skills. He just lacks experience and finesse. <laughs> Fishing isn't as easy as he'd like. Sometimes he'll get lucky, but he won't get too fat. Sub-adults may stick together with their litter mates for consolation, or even pal around with other sub-adults for a little while. But Kodiak bears are generally loners. Given the opportunity, bears travel the paths of least resistance. Each new generation walks in the footsteps of their ancestors. They've been doing this for thousands of years, wearing deep ruts across the countryside. They can also handle the most arduous terrain almost effortlessly, and they can travel up to 30 miles an hour. At least the grown-ups can. They also like shortcuts, As they travel in search of food, Kodiak bears take in the world with a sensory acuteness we can barely imagine. For years, people believed bears had poor eyesight, but they appear to see about as well as we do, and their hearing is superior. A brown bear can hear normal human conversation from more than 300 yards away. And no animal has the bear's acute sense of smell. 
A bear can detect human scent up to 14 hours after we pass through an area. And it can sniff out edible roots. Native Americans used to say that when a pine needle fell in the forest, the eagle saw it, the deer heard it, and the bear smelled it. Bears use this keen sense of smell to locate other bears. Wherever they go, both male and female bears leave their scent on the landscape. Scientists don't agree on why they do it, or even if it's purposeful, but the bears seem to pursue scent trails more actively during mating season. This is the only time adult males and females have anything to do with one another. The female is ready to breed for just two weeks in early summer, so the male is an eager suitor. Even relentless. Eventually, she lets him come close. Their moment of passion lasts a day, or perhaps a week. Afterwards, he will forget her to resume his life as a bachelor. To her enormous relief. It will be months before the embryos actually begin to grow in her womb and then only if she's able to store up enough fat to support a pregnancy through the long winter. Ray, put that in the, in the back against there. Bear biologists okay. have been uh, gathering data uh, about the reproductive cycles of Kodiak yeah, bears bear since the early 1980s using radio telemetry. They dart more than 30 bears each year, immobilizing them for about 90 minutes so they can attach a radio collar. Radio tracking gives wildlife managers crucial information about how well the bears are doing. They used to believe cubs were weaned as two-year-olds, but radio tracking revealed that half the cubs nurse until they're three. This means each female produces fewer cubs than previously thought. And that changes how bear managers plan for the future. The research on reproduction uh, in the brown bear, we've been working on that for up to 15 years, and so we don't just get snapshots, we get individual females that will follow through three or four litters, and, and we really get a strong data set that's very difficult to get. Okay. We've probably followed over 200 uh, adult females. Yeah. How old did you say she was? This sow's uh, 18 years old this spring. Adult Kodiaks typically live to be about 20 years old. Lower lips, yeah, 433. Looks good. Well, let me check the other one here. We thought she might come out with some cubs this year, but uh, she wasn't successful. So hopefully next year she'll come out with a new litter of cubs. Okay. Light it in her. Okay, good. There you go. Of the females presumed pregnant when they move into their dens, researchers now know only half may actually emerge with cubs. That's not what you call a functional left ear, is it? Producing a litter requires phenomenal reserves of energy. The 
the biologists first collared Rachel in 1983. Kodiak bears begin to reproduce sometime after they turn six, and Rachel has been one of the most productive mothers in the study. Rachel's a patient mother. She teaches her new litter where to find the best food and how to catch it. The cubs learn quickly if they happen to be paying attention. Over the years, she's given birth to 14 cubs. If this litter is successful, she will have reared 11 to independence. All summer long, the melting snowpack from the mountain peaks spills down into Kodiak's 400 rivers and streams. These endless waters are the spawning ground for six species of salmon. Once the salmon runs start, Rachel devotes much of the day to fishing, and the cubs tag along hungry for knowledge. She may catch 15 fish in an hour. Enough for herself and all her cubs. The abundant salmon are an essential source of protein for Kodiak bears. They also rely on grasses and sedges in early summer. And even during the thick of the salmon run in July and August, they may abandon the fish to search for berries. but the glittering vision of leaping salmon always draws them back. While Rachel is out fishing, a young bear named Marilyn turns up. It isn't a good time for a visit. Rachel calls a warning to her cubs. If necessary, a mother will give her life to defend her cubs. Rachel charges, and Marilyn heads for other fishing grounds. Biologists have observed that offspring often fish in the exact same manner and even in the same places as their mothers.
Marilyn's adept at the usual technique of finding fish in shallow water. When she's had lots to eat, she gets picky, removing only the choicest parts, skin, brain, and roe. Gulls wait for the scraps. Marilyn also catches fish by snorkeling in the deeper parts of the river. She's a strong swimmer, and even when not fishing, she seems to enjoy just paddling around. Like dogs, bears lack sweat glands, so one good way to cool off is to wade in the river. Bears seem to remember from year to year when the fish will spawn and when different plants ripen. This vital information passes from generation to generation. Because man and bear share the same trails, people need to know what bears are after and give them space. And what bears are mostly after is food. They spend 60% of their time feeding. The bears depend on a healthy salmon population and so do Kodiak's human residents. About 30% of them make their living from the fishing industry. It's a multi-million dollar industry built on salmon. Even for people in the fishing industry, the bears are never far out of mind. Brian Waddell is a seasonal worker at a remote cannery. This year we flew out and the pilot pointed out a dead whale that's beached over on the shore. He said the bears had been frequenting here. Almost every morning I've been coming out here watching the bears. Bears are opportunists and they scout coastal areas for beached marine mammals. Bears have huge appetites and one good whale can feed a crowd. It's really exciting when I come in and see 10, 12 bears here and seem so happy and content that they got a great source of food that they don't mind me coming in. It's almost like seeing them on a drive up restaurant. They just walk up, pick a spot they want to eat, settle down and start chewing away, pulling flesh off the whale. be able to paddle within 10 to 15 yards of them. It's a remarkable thing to see. And sometimes they rear up, look at me, check me out. I think they have a kind of sense I'm not gonna bother them, I'm just there to watch them. It seems to me that the more it rots, the more the bears like it. Bears don't normally feed this close together. But the rules change when there's this much food to go around. The whale is a gift 
from the sea gods. In late September, the final run of salmon makes its way to Carluck Lake. Gloria, a regular visitor here, comes in search of fish with her two yearling cubs. They've done well this summer, judging by their bulk and the sheen of their coats. The cubs have doubled in weight since they came out of the den. But with six weeks to go before they head back into hibernation, they still need to pile on fat. Gloria has a reputation as a tyrant on the river. She's used brawn and a make my day attitude to rear several cups successfully. But she's also a loving mother, generous with her cubs in their time together on the river, helping them learn the essential tools of survival on Kodiak. The spawning run is a great smorgasbord for bears. The river serves up plenty of salmon and garnishes it with a little floating vegetation. Biologists call this hyperphagia, literally binge eating to prepare for hibernation. A bear must gorge itself almost non-stop, laying on five or six inches of fat to survive the coming winter. In deep hibernation, a bear may lose 10 pounds a week. Young bears must learn where to find food from their mothers. But Katie's passing on some dangerous information to her brood. The way to the dump outside the village of Larson Bay. Many bears know it as an easy place to grub a meal. It's also easy to get into trouble here. Katie has to be alert for intruders. As the stranger approaches, Katie rounds up her cubs. And then she attacks. The stranger retreats, and Katie hobbles back to her cubs on an injured foot. This is one place where bears and humans cross paths and sometimes come into conflict.
The people of Larson Bay often visit for a low budget brand of bear watching. This is our Larson Bay bear viewing program. Uh, you can come and go as you please. We prefer to come up here rather than a bowling alley or going to the movie since we don't have one. It's a fun thing to do. Everybody comes up here on the weekends and sits here and watches the bears. We saw the mother with the two cubs and the mother with the four cubs and both of the mothers were fighting and then the male boar came. For Katie, the pickings are easy here with a hidden price. The dump teaches bears to associate food with humans, and if Katie's cubs take this lesson to heart, it may ultimately lead them into a deadly encounter. This bear ventured too close to someone's home and paid with his life. Alaskan law allows people to kill any animal that threatens them. Yeah. Although no one has ever been killed by a Kodiak bear, people kill an average of 10 to 12 bears on Kodiak Island every year in self-defense. A lot of people have never encountered bears in the wild, and, and the first time they do, well, all their fear comes to focus at once. Until you've been in someone else's shoes, so when a bear comes close to you, uh, it's pretty hard to second guess what someone else felt. We humans put temptation in the bear's path, and not just with our dumps and garbage cans. People from outside the island often venture into bear country. And it's never easy to keep natural fears under control. Makes you a little nervous when they crash around out here in the water. It's kind of a thrill, though. They haven't figured out how to fish yet, so they seem to want to come in and rob your kitchen. It's easier pickings. We try not to keep any fish, though until uh, the last day, because fish is one of the biggest attractions for the bear to come in. Keep them nice and clean. Wherever bears and humans walk the same paths, we compete and often clash. The only remedy is for us to educate ourselves about the space and resources they need so that at least on this one remote island, bears, not humans, will continue to dominate the land. It ought to be easy in a place as vast as Kodiak. The food is abundant enough for people and bears alike. but the lessons being taught at the edge of the wilderness are often painful. Of the four mothers that have led us on this journey in the footsteps of a bear, only three are still living. Katie, the protective mother. Gloria, the tyrant. And soft hearted Shelly. They've been savvy enough to survive confrontations with other bears and with humans. But since this film was shot, at least half their cubs appear to have died. In their time at the dump, 
Katie's four youngsters became hooked on human food. Several of them later wandered too close to people and were killed. Researchers found Rachel in her den by the signal from her radio collar. She was dead at age 19, apparently of natural causes. The three cubs she had nurtured so carefully probably starved to death. But bears have been enduring the cruel lessons dealt out by Kodiak for thousands of years. And when the cold comes this year, the survivors will head back into high country and find a snug den, as they always have. For some, it will be their last winter together as a family. For others, the first. They will travel to their dens on the paths where countless generations of bears before them have left their footprints on this landscape. All we humans need to do is stand back and give them room. And their paths will mark this island as the home of the Kodiak bear forever.